session this morning. Our first speaker will be uh, Adam Pinnestel um, from U University of Copenhagen. And the topic of his talk is Where the Stone Meets the Sky, Elucidations on Indo-European Cosmological Thought. Thank you. So I'm going to continue in Laura's spirit from yesterday. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, our light expert is gone now. <laughs> so I'm going to continue in Laura spirit from yesterday. It's going to be a little uh, lighter and not so rooted in uh, textual evidence and I'm not gonna talk for a long time about the uh, stone sky connection per se I guess everyone is familiar with the fact that we have a uh, connection some some kind of connection in Indo-European between uh, the sky and the stone it's one of the most well-known distinguishing features of Indo-European cosmology um, something we all uh, hear about and learn, all new students learn about, uh, that uh, there is an image of the sky as made of some kind of so stone substance, and that this is based on evidence from uh, the lexicon, uh, where especially Indo-Iranian um, shows, well, parts of the lexicon that means both sky and stone, Fam most famously the word Ashman, becoming Asman in Avesta and sky and stone, and we uh, indic evidence as well. Whereas later on in Iranian, it's not so clear that we have a meaning uh, stone, but but uh, there might be there might be uh, scarce evidence that that it continued even in the other Iranian branches than Avesta. I will not go into that today, but um, you can read a little bit more about it in Daniele Guizzo's uh, very fascinating article about celestial bodies in, well, it's called in Talishi, but it's, he actually speaks a lot about a lot of Iranian languages. And the words for sky, uh, based on words for stone, but also words for metal, substance, iron, and you can kind of see the development as presumably the Iron Age uh, emerges how this is also known from from Iranian mythologies and literatures how you can see how um, uh, in the beginning in the Western texts and in, in older texts uh, as described by among others Mary Boyce if you want an introduction you can see how uh, the, sc the, the sky is described as made of uh, the hardest stone there is uh, one place uh, in in the Yasht, uh, where you can see that they they describe the sky as made of a stone as big as a house, or uh, the, and there are other places where in Iranian texts where the the sky is made of crystal, um, and presumably you can see a development from stone to crystal. It's not that clear, but it's clear that you can see a development later into. A perception of the sky uh, is made of metal, uh, iron, 
And in some of the languages, even words that cover both are used, for example, in Paklavi, where, uh, you know, the word for diamond and steel uh, is the same. So you can, you can imagine how the uh, perception does not necessarily contradict the other perception, but that, that something bright and shiny and hard um, is uh, the substance of, of the sky, or that's maybe not even the perception, but it could also be maybe just an impressionistic description, because of course, even uh, cultures with firm beliefs in what's going on up there uh, do not necessarily refrain from uh, describing uh, impressionistically what they see, like, like uh, we do. We talk about crystal clear sky, um, even if we know, well, that's the adjective, but I mean, you can also, uh, there are many other examples. Uh, we're going to talk about the roof of the world, for example. So it, it's, it's, it's clear that uh, descriptions or terms do not necessarily need to reflect actual beliefs, uh, which is, of course, a bit boring for people who are interested in Indo-European religion, but not so boring for people who are interested in etymology, because this is another uh, possibility. Uh, Melanie Malzahn has, in a recent article in the Festry for Klein, has uh, described the, uh, the use of Ashani in uh, Vedic, also in this context. And as I said, Daniele Guizzo's article is concerned with all kinds of modern Iranian evidence. Uh, also, the word Ashwan, meaning proto-Iranian Ashwan, meaning um, some kind of metal, iron, presumably. Uh, confused with the original Ashman, you can see in, in borrowings into Turkic languages that they are confused. So some have both side by side, Asman and Aspan in the same meaning. But the Indo-European equation is not least based on a comparison of these conditions in Indo-Iranian with Proto-Germanic, the Proto-Germanic words for hammer and sky. And then, of course, also the morphology of it, that you can see traces of an old heteroclitic um, inflection and as the basis of uh, derivation as well. The uh, meanings of and use of Greek uh, akmon in this context has been discussed, uh, I wouldn't say recently, but at least in a comparatively recent article by Miles Beckwith not going to go into the Greek details today because and in, in, in general, I'm not going to go so much into the connections between sky and stone in general, because I think that's basic knowledge for all Indo-Europeanists and people who are dealing with uh, Indo-European studies in general. Um, I'm just going to give you a short footnote to the Germanic connection there, which is not the focus of my paper today, <laughs> just because I'm I mentioned that this is this plays a role for the reconstruction of the Indo-Europeanness of the concept and not just the Indo-Iranianness of it. And that's of course that the other language family that displays the double meaning, presumably, at least in, in different derivatives, the double meaning stone and sky is Germanic. But I don't actually think that Germanic does that. Uh, I have also talked about earlier how Old Norse Hamar. Uh, Hamar um, and Proto-Germanic Hamara it does not actually mean stone, but it means the back of an axe used as a hammer and then cliffs that are shaped like that. And you can see that in, in, um, in place names as well, but also in the meanings of Old Norse uh, Hamar. Um, and my <laughs> suggestion or my, my own opinion about this is that the Finnic loanword Hamara, which means the back of a, an axe or back of a knife, um, is not a loan word from Proto-Germanic, but it's borrowed into Proto-Germanic because in Sami languages that are related to uh, Finnic languages, you have the same word with the same meaning with an S, and that S cannot come from Germanic H. We know that already. So, uh, And, and uh, compared even to Mordvin languages, so other Finnic languages, you can see that this must go back to a, an earlier form with a sibilant. And I would not exclude that this word is ultimately the same as Ashmara in Indo-Iranian, so mm -hmm. still the same word, only uh, it took a detour 
and came back. So, so it's it's not borrowed from um, it's not borrowed in Finnic from from uh, Germanic, but the other way around. But this does not exclude the Indo-Europeanness of the term per se. Um, so now back to the main subject, uh, because I would still agree that the sky is made of stone in Indo-European, and what does that mean? Have you ever wondered what that means? I wondered a lot when I heard the first time, maybe because, um, as I just talked to Kenneth Zisk about, we, I, I grew up in an environment that was strongly linguistic, and even though we were fascinated by cultural uh, uh, cultural aspects of Indo-European studies and philological ones. We are. Uh, I grew up in a strongly linguistic uh, environment and was raised by a, a linguist. So, so uh, we didn't talk a lot about what it meant that the sky is made of stone substance. And I felt that this is kind of left to everyone's own interpretation. There is no uh, no unanimity prevails as to what this means in general. I think, but you can of course contradict me if you think it's. But at least you can see different interpretations in different um, accounts. And uh, just to take a few examples, Gamkalitsa and Ivanov write about how this is probably connected to the um, perception or a description of uh, tall mountains as the roof of the world, uh, which is, by the way, probably originally an East Iranian concept borrowed into um, Western languages uh, via explorers, um, but but uh, at least Sanskrit Parvata has the double meaning mountain and cloud, which is mentioned by Gankhalitsi Ivanov. That's one possibility. The other one is, again, a very uh, impressionistic description, the modern metaphor, uh, also the modern metaphor, the heavenly vault, vault, of course, not just a modern metaphor, but also a modern metaphor. So we, we don't, uh, inside our, at least inside my mind, there is no this is this could just be a, a description of the shape and doesn't need to mean anything um, literal. And then, of course, there are the famous connections to meteorites and the divine weapon thunderbolts and so on. I won't go into to that because that's an entire subject of its own. And then the uh, Iranian traditions that I mentioned, perhaps the, the hard stone is simply uh, rock crystal or crystal. Uh, there are probably many other uh, interpretations possible. And just to give you a little illustrations there, uh, the, the roof of the world. I mean, it is, to me at least, it's, it's, it's a little bit counterintuitive to talk about being on the roof of the world when you are just on the, on the tallest place in the world. When, I mean, the roof should be the sky, right, and not the, the mountains. But this is what it is in in Himalaya, the Pamir Mountains, and so on. And then a few other uh, uh, yeah depictions. Or so so to the right, you can see this is I, I like this picture from the American film director Dustin Lance Black. He uh, posted this. A uh, picture from France where he says, a piece of the sky, I'm afraid the sky is falling. I found a chunk of it lodged in a field here in France. And our own Prince Henrik, had a, who, who uh, lived in Vietnam, had an <coughs> uh, exhibition once um, on uh, jade and other stones found in Asia, which was called sky stone. So the concept of sky stone or sunstone is not uh, uncommon, also in a non-European context. Even in, in Indo -European, other Indo European languages, no, without these words involved, you have Grienchloch in Irish, meaning sunstone, uh, which is, I, I didn't write that, but which is uh, quartz. And in the English lapidary, uh, the appearance of the sapphire is described as like the sun, um, showing that the sun is, is used sometimes of the blue sky as a whole, which you can also see in uh, Iranian. Persian uh, traditional stories in Middle Persian, in, 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 in early Persian, early modern Persian. The sky has edges of blue color. It's not just, it, it doesn't just have blue color because the sky is also the sun. Um, and now to the substance of what we're going to talk about. So Avestan uh, has this concept of thvasha, 
the firmament actually, which is not just a uh, biblical or, or a Semitic Middle Eastern concept, uh, but also a, a apparently an Indo-European concept, or at least it, it occurs in Indo-European traditions, that you have more than just one sky uh, or heavens. So you have uh, Vasha, which is the firmament of the sky, the hard sky, uh, contrasted with the highest highest heaven, and in in some traditions there are even more. But but the the basic um, well, the, the important fact here is that we distinguish between the hard sky, the the immediate visible sky, and the the heavens that we can't see above. And this word is homophonous with vasha meaning uh, fast, the adjective, uh, which we know already from Vedic tvarta, fast. So that means that most often uh, when you, I, I think most people who talk about the origin of, of the word for the the high, the Tvasha heaven or the sky in Iranian, they don't actually, or in Avestan, they, they don't doubt that this is the same word and that it somehow means the fast one. Not many people write about it, but but they do, you know, en passant, they say this is probably just a some kind of uh, secondary meaning of, of the same substantivation of the same adjective um, with this development of, of uh, uh, a to long a in front of uh, the esh that comes from rt as as also in in the word for wagon for example and and these these uh, pictures by the way are of course not from any iranian tradition they're just just to show some european medieval uh, mm -hmm. uh, perceptions also as uh, of the of the firmament that you had the heavens outside the firmament and the idea is that the the, the stars are uh, placed in uh, in, in the visible sky, whereas the heavens are behind and that the light from the heavens shine through. And you, you have to think about transparent versus translucid. So the sky is translucid like quartz, for example, but not, uh, well, the clearest quartz is, is almost transparent, but, but mostly translucid and uh, the, um, or translucent and the, uh, uh, Transparency is something else. So you can't really see what's going on up there, but you can see the light from the heavens. And I think, uh, quite remarkably, the uh, old Russian or the, the Slavic word for the heavenly vault or the firmament is the same word as the one that's usually uh, viewed as having been borrowed into Germanic as the word for quartz. So normally or in, in german actually because this happened uh in the uh, west slavic area into german quite late uh so we have it in in uh, middle high german and uh, we know the slavic word as both the uh the the base and the firmament so probably derived from twerf to to be solid which you also have in baltic twirtas with another uh, presumably another suffix, but uh, of course here in Copenhagen there is a possibility when you, if, if the root end, ends in a laryngeal, you can have a merger of laryngeal and T and then thereby get uh, something that ends up in Slavic as D. Um, but this makes it of course uh, different in any case from, from the Lithuanian uh, adjective Tvirtas. And there is an old connection with the Slavic word by uh, I think originally Valde or some of the traditional uh, uh, neogrammarians, um, but again taken up by Anna Dubois, that uh, that the Greek uh, Sardion, the uh, the name of the Sard or Carnelian, which is actually red quartz, is uh, actually connected to this word. But but this of course means that the D will have to be a real D, because you cannot uh, get uh, D from aspirated anything. So, so if that's true, then the, the, the um, extension is real, is an actual D. And then, um, so, so, so the basic idea here would be that Svasha in Avestan is actually the same word, meaning just uh, originally something that's firm, solid, so that's the firmament, and uh, connected simply, the root would be twerf, um, and, and you can we can discuss whether there are different formations, different uh, root extensions, but at least the, 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 
the, the meaning of the root will still be solid, and then you can have, uh, from like in Latin, firmus, you can have firmamentum. I know it's not an old word, but, um, and, 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 uh, and you can also talk about a solid rock, for example. But, but if you have a belief or an impression that the firmamentum uh, is crystal, then of course there is not, it's not so far. Uh, if you go from, from the material of the firmamentum, um, to appear momentum or the other way around, that's not, uh, it's not a far distance. And if you go to Germanic, um, the meanings of Old Norse Dwerger is actually uh, very apropos uh, what uh, Professor Garcia Roman talked about, the pillars upholding the heaven and earth. Uh, in Old Norse, we have a Dwerger uh, means not only a dwarf, but it also means a pillar, or at least it's used about in the old Icelandic homily book about uh, pillars. <coughs> and also brooches. So, of course, something holding up something, but also connected to the, that part of the brooch which will have, which will contain a precious stone. And the four dwarves, Nordri, Sudri, Austri, and Vestri, are known to, um, well, they uphold the heavenly dome by each supporting one of the four cardinal points. Um, so so the, the, there is a word, uh, dwerga, dwerger, which comes constitutes these uh, pillars holding up the firmamentum or the, the immediate sky. And uh, I think it's, it's remarkable that in um, Scandinavian languages, the word for the traditional word for quartz or rock crystal is a compound of dwerg and words for stone, which of course have been in interpreted in terms of uh, folk belief as the, mm. the, the dwarves are the ones who, who uh, create these precious stones but, but uh, because they're smiths, but I mean, um, but as, as we shall see here in the end, thank you, uh, there are other uh, <coughs> indications that might point to an original meaning quartz in, um, in Germanic as well, or at least in Scandinavian. In Sweden, there is a place named Dvashet uh, in Jemtland, which used to be Danish area. And it's usually interpreted as the, uh, so we have it in, in Old Swedish as Dvergaseta, so it's clear that this is the word that occurs as the first member of the compound. But we, we don't really have a good interpretation of it because there is no myth about dwarves or anything, and it could mean spiders, but then again, if it's the pasture of the spiders, why, do, why, why does Dwerga not occur in other names like that? But it turns out that Offerdalen, where this, is, uh, this, this area in Sweden is one of the very few places in Sweden with uh, actual mining locations for rock crystal because there is a lot of occurrence of rock crystal. And then, of course, uh, what you all have been thinking about uh, while I showed these slides is, yes, but Germanic has D and not thorn, so this cannot be twer. Uh, and I will leave this up for discussion, but, but at least I can say that there is some evidence uh, in Germanic, apparently, that uh, or in Scandinavian languages, that uh, there might have been a variant uh, Thwerga as well, because Norwegian dialects, some Norwegian dialects have Tverk, they display that form, and uh, it occurs also in place names, such as Tverkastein, which is, by the way, a famous farm as well, the uh, summer house of the uh, Norwegian author Adenis. And, of course, you may say that this is uh, evidence of lack, <coughs> uh, or uh, but, but the German evidence is ambiguous because uh, the Old High German clusters merged in Middle High German and we don't have it from Old High German, so you can't actually see it in German. But of course you could say, since most Germanic languages uh, show Dwer, then you would probably uh, say Dwer there as well. But then uh, something that's not in the abstract, so that's the only new thing that you couldn't have prepared, uh, for is that uh, if you delve into the Swedish place names archives, you can actually see that this place name that I mentioned before, the Tvashet, is actually mentioned as pronounced also with a T. So Tvashet, it, it seems to actually has, have a uh, variant with T as well. Um, and this is, occurs several times. So not only from one account, but several accounts. Here it's also in the end, Tvashet. And, uh, and you even have a farm name or Fairbuda, uh, which is Tvashet Budana, which in, uh, in, in that dialect also occurs as, uh, yeah, with a T. And then finally, a very speculative uh, uh, 
slide that I probably should have omitted, but uh, in Danish we also have place names where you, with uh, TV, ER, you don't know where it comes from. There is no immediate, I mean, it looks like it means the cross place, but I mean, there, there's no evidence for that. It's just uh, any place can be a crossing, right? But, but um, it, is, it has been described geologi geologically as uh, a place with blue quartz and uh, also in a, in a national Danish novel. You have the account of how the, the church was built with blue quartz and so on. So, um, so I'll end here uh, just by showing you this uh, translucid sky and quartz and hopefully uh, gave you some food for thought. Not all of it is, of course, uh, <laughs> conclusive, but what, what the general idea would be is that, that when, at least in late Indo-European, because we don't really have any evidence here from early Indo-European, but at least in late Indo-European, this is to be uh, uh, interpreted as the sky is made of crystal, just like in Avestan, and that, that uh, Thvasha, uh, meaning the firmamentum, <laughs> is actually the, um, the court's word. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We have time for questions. Do we? Oh, yes. <laughs> A little bit. Comments? Mm -hmm. uh, just a little mm -hmm. detail for clarification. You translated Russia uh, as fast. I suppose you mean firm. You took the Danish word. Um, no, I think. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but eilich rasch is the is the meaning of uh, of tvarta. Uh, and Spaß? Yeah. Okay. So like quick. Yeah. Okay. So so Sorry. my point is that that does not make sense. But this is what people Sorry. say because then it's I'm, a homophobe. I'm with you. Yeah. So, so, so basically, I'm not aware of any anyone else having an idea why the firmament would be the Eilich one. No. But, but <laughs> if if you have, <laughs> I'm interested. Well, well it may be worth uh, also using the adjective uh, uh, "handros" in Greek. Uh, it means uh, 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 could be uh, shiny, but also fast in the sense of uh, uh, rapidity, swiftness. Of okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, you may even, yeah, thank you, I'll note that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one line you might want to pursue in that a little bit, you, you look at the, uh, well, found in the ancient Indian cosmological tradition found in Jyotisha, uh, the tradition of astral science where there was a description of the universe as a crystalline sea. Uh, that also occurred, I think, in older literature, but mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Maybe somebody here in the room would know where that idea originally comes from. But I, I think you can find it in aspects of ancient uh, uh, mathematical or, or astronomical literature, even going back to the uh, Mesopotamian period. Mm -hmm. I'm, not I'm not sure, but it is something worth looking at. I would but be happy to get some your, your whole theme here. references. Very yeah. nice one. I would be happy to, to uh, look into that and get some references. Yeah, the, the point here was just that uh, if you only had D, then of course it, it doesn't fit the other the other material. Yeah, that's what, that's yeah. What I mean. so, so the alternation is is okay, but the if if Germanic just had Dwerga, it would not be. I mean, 
yeah, relevant. That's, that's my point. Like you can just uh, assume that uh, this is a piece of the password mesh, and uh, I think you can reconstruct uh, a dramatic uh, tour, a dramatic tour, and, uh, and therefore uh, original. Thank you. Yeah, I had a similar comment actually, but I <laughs> don't think I would agree because uh, one of the languages where you see the diff differences, of course, English. And yeah, but that seems to show that it was a real D. You, know, you mean keep the, uh, the difference in, uh, in, in the general or in, uh, in this yeah, cluster, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Um, there seem to be other uh, alternations in Scandinavian dialect. So you have the variant uh, Verk as well, which means dwarf. I don't know. So it could be a dialectal treatment, local dialectal treatment of the or yeah, as you already I, noticed, uh, of course. Yeah. I am um, obviously had that thought, and I must admit that this is I haven't looked into that. I wanted to see if local dialects in these area in these particular areas had a development from Dwerth to Twer, which is of course it could happen any time. In any language, right? So, so you're absolutely right that that this needs. I need to <laughs> see, look into that, and even it could be, of course, be lexical as well, because it, there could be some confusion with other words. I mean, we just saw in the, I think it was the Humbly book where you have the word for the crossbeam, yeah. it's the thwertre. Yeah, it, it occurs in the same line. I mean, so, yeah. so, uh, but, so, but in general, I want to say that also it's. Uh, I mean, you don't you don't need this Germanic word to make no. your case and. Yeah, I, uh, it's true. And for the investment word, I guess you, the parallel you need is English fat, which is, uh, <laughs> I guess, comes from. I thought Berlin, about uh, mentioning it just now. Does it? Yeah. Uh, did, did, did you mention that? Or? No. No, you, no, you were the okay. first one who mentions it. Okay. Yeah. I thought about it, but you, you mentioned it, and it's true. I mean, fast obviously is that word, which means yeah. solid. <laughs> so so there is a parallel. Yeah. I, I know there is. I mean, it's, it's just. Um, <laughs> I don't know how it's. I mean, what is the what is the logical, what is the semantic connection between them? I don't actually know, but but I I, I know it's the same word. So yeah. Be, I guess, yeah. 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 So one very quick last question. No, behind. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That the the Avestan word for the the visible sky, the hard sky, is uh, this. It's, it's it looks as if it's the same word as a, uh, an adjective that means fast, quick. So, uh, I also have Okay. Yeah, that will of course provide some logic to it. But but as as Chris already pointed out, the the word fast in English is originally a word meaning solid. So 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 there is already a typological connection between the two. And of course, I agree with you that that of course the Germanic part that took up maybe most time, uh, or at least more more slides, is of course not necessary for the for the Thrasher connection at all, or even the this uh, this. Um, Equation, or this, 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 uh, the claim that this was the perception of the sky. But I still find it a little bit significant, though, that that the only place name in Sweden which has this shape is also um, the the only one where you have serious mining locations. Of course, this could be because of the word dwarf, if if because I mean there is a folk folk, folk belief connection between dwarfs as smiths and and uh, I mean. It, it is possible in, in other ways. So uh, so you're absolutely right that, that this part of the paper, this part of the um, etymological family is not necessary and you can leave it out. And also because obviously the uh, the uh, extension of the root is of course different. I mean, I, I didn't provide any explanation for this, so this is also up for interpretation. So let's thank our speaker again. And the next speaker will be uh, Corinna Scheingardner from the University of Cologne.
<coughs> the topic of our talk will be Old Germanic and Old Celtic theonyms, the onomastic evidence for language and culture contact in Roman provincial antiquity. <laughs> Today, I would like to present to you some results from my PhD thesis, uh, which I have submitted at the University of Cologne this summer. And in my dissertation, I have collected and evaluated Old Germanic and Old Celtic theonyms, which are attested in Roman uh, epi epigraphy of the provinces of Northwestern Europe. And these uh, are dating from the first until the fifth century of our time. In most cases, the semantics of theonyms uh, can be elicited by etymological investigation and linguistic allocation of the stems and suffixes in use. Some theonyms, however, feature potential language contact phenomena between the Germanic and Celtic speaking <coughs> tribes, and some can be either Celtic or Germanic. Just don't ask Google about it because it contradicts itself. It's saying Dikagambeda is a Germanic goddess in the German article of Wikipedia and it says it's a Celtic goddess in the English one. One major subgroup of theonyms are the so-called matrons names. The matrons in Latin matres or matronae were female deities venerated in Germania, Eastern Gaul and Northern Italy. They are often depicted on votive altars in groups of three. In the Latin inscriptions on these altars, the deities named turn out to be either Celtic or Germanic or both. For instance, the complex derivational suffixes, which are typical in the matron's names, like ihen, like in Mersihenai, like ane, like in Betaranehai, or like ine, like in Vanginehai, these suffixes have convincingly been derived from old Celtic suffix conglomerates, Ikin, Onik, and Inik, by means of language contact. I have dealt with the suffixes in detail in an article which was published in the MOOC Symposium uh, Proceedings, uh, which was held in Vienna, 2012. But besides this very interesting group of matrons' names, there are several single deities in the pagan pantheon of our Germanic and Celtic ancestors, whose names too feature both Celtic or Germanic traits, or whose names were borrowed from one language to the other. Another such witness for Celtic Germanic language contact is the name of the goddess Baduena. She was a local Frisian goddess of battle whose name is handed down to us by Tacitus. I do not go into details on this name here since it is not epigraphically attested, but you can read about it in my article in the Festschrift for Peter Anreiter from 2016. In my talk here today, I'm focusing on the epigraphically attested theonyms of Northwestern Europe, and I would like to present and evaluate the evidence for language contact between the Celts, Romans, and Germanic tribes. By discussing the in individual etymology of theonyms, as well as their geographic distribution and genuine linguistic classification, we might be able to answer some research questions. In order to do so, I have placed my focus on those theonyms with abnormal orthographic representations on doublet forms and on theonyms, which could theoretically be both Celtic and Germanic regarding their etymologies. Let us start with those names which appear as doublets, that is in both Germanic and Celtic form. The first name pair shall be the Matronae, Alagabiae and Ologabiae respectively. For both name forms each, there are two <coughs> attestations. Alagabiae is perfectly analyzable as a Germanic compound consisting of ala, an archaic or compound form of Germanic alla, o, and of the element gabi, meaning giver or giving. Ologabiae, however, can equally be derived from Celtic olo, o, and the element gabi, giving, giver. Patricia de Bernardo Stempel has argued in her 2005 article that in continental Celtic, the semantics of the root gab was still to give and not yet to take, as in Old Irish gavit, to take. Thus, she argues that the name was translated from Celtic into Germanic. But the other way around is equally possible. Stefan Schumacher, referring to Schmidt, points out that other Germanic names in Gabiae 
such as the theonym uh, Fria Gabiae, for which there is no Celtic equivalent, ra rather recommend a translation from Germanic into Celtic. In the end, we can only make presumptions on the origin of this name pair, if it is a Germanicized Celtic name or a Celticized Germanic name. But either way, it is a striking feature of Celtic Germanic language content. Let us conclude with a glimpse on the map and its geographic distribution of the attestations. The Germanic name form Alagabiae is located in the north, in the lower Rhine region, while the Celtic name form is located further in the south, in the upper Rhine region. The second name pair we will examine are the doublet forms Ambia Marcae and Ambio Marcae. The difference in these doublets is the thematic vowel of the first compound <coughs> member, which is four times a and once o. As Celtic o corresponds to, corresponds to Germanic a, the occurrence of ambia next to ambio is best explained as a Germanization feature. From the lexical point of view, this looks like a Celtic compound. Ambio and Marco as the elements. The first element, ambio, is most probably a thematic derivation of the Celtic preposition ambi, around. The Germanic equivalent of this ambi would be umbi. The latter element, Marco, however, would mean horse in Celtic, so the full name would translate as having a horse around or having a horse by one side. This analysis is not completely impossible, but semantically and functionally rather unlikely for Matron's name, for these mother goddesses are usually not depicted or associated with gods, uh, with horses. Sorry. So according to the Cumulus Opinio, the second element, Marca, should rather be analyzed as Germanic, and there is indeed a one matching lexeme, which means border or region. So the Ambio Marcae would be the matrons who are dwelling on both sides of the border, which is probably referring to the Rhine as a natural border. Linguistically, we are thus dealing with a hybrid compound, which consists of a Celtic first compound member and a Germanic second compound member. Another explanation at hand is that Ambio Marcae is itself a partial translation into Germanic of a Celtic ambio brogai, where only the second element Celtic brogai was replaced with its Germanic uh, equivalent marcai. Either way, this doublet pair with both phonological and lexical Germanization features constitutes another witness of the Celtic Germanic language contact along the Rhine. When we have a look on the map, we see a familiar distribution Again, the more can genuinely Celtic appearing name form Ambio Marcus is located in the most southward attestation from Kilmagen, <coughs> while the Germanicized form Ambia Marcus is attested in a larger area north and northwest of it. But since even Ambio Marcae is a hybrid form, we can assume language contact all across the area as indicated by the pine spots. Now we are done with doublet theonyms and we'll move on to another matron's name, which was Germanicized phonologically. The matris medio tautechai were venerated in Cologne. We have only one attestation of this name. Etymologically, we are dealing with a transparent derivation from a Celtic compound. The first element medio in the middle of, and the second element is Celtic tota, people or polity. <coughs> The name is derived from this compound by the matron's name suffix ech, and phonologically it was partially Germanicized. Au is the Germanic representation of the Celtic diphthong O, but different from the previous ambia marcae, the O vowel of medio was not changed into a here. But the typ uh, typical matron's name suffix ech itself is a Germanicized Celtic suffix ich. So altogether, medio tau tehai is partially Germanicized from Celtic medio tauticae, and its overall meaning was in the middle of polity or in the middle of commonwealth. Since this name is a hapax, there is no reason for mapping its geographic situation, and I assume that you all know where Cologne is situated. Our next goddess is the Dia Ludana. Her name is attested four times in some orthographic variation concerning the dental and the suffix vowel. In the attestation of Eversheim, the dental is written with the Greek letter theta, probably indicating a Germanic dental fricative. 
and the suffix vowel e deviates from the other instances where we have an a. Because of the ch on the onset on the name, we are inclined to see a genuinely Germanic name in it. This is of course possible. On a Germanic etymology for this name, you can read in my dissertation, which is soon to be published in a series uh, Innsbrucker, Innsbrucker Beiträge für Sprachwissenschaft. Today, I would like to restrict myself on the possible Celtic context scenario concerning the Styrnum. In the Lugodonensis, there are two attestations of the Celtic goddess Clutoida, which translates as the famous one. So it is very likely that in Hludana, the same root is in course, uh, is in use, and that's the uh, root for clevos, for fame in the European, but only a different suffix is in use. So Hludana could represent the phonological Germanization of a Celtic Clutona. A similar approach has been suggested by De Bernardo Stempel and Torians already. The geographic situation of Hludana is as follows. The southernmost attestation is the one with the apparent orthography. All attestations are, are located along the Rhine in the north from the Delta Rhine down along the lower Rhine region. I have added the two instances of Plutoida in central Gaul. The distance between the respective fine spots is rather high, but nevertheless, the contact induced genesis of the name Hludana from a Celtic Clutona cannot be or excluded. The next theonym is another hapax from Cologne, where an altar is dedicated to the Gantuni. The end of the name is broken in the inscription. Traditional etymologies include the Germanic lexeme Ganta, goose, and presume a cult of waterfowl also for the Germanic religion. We know that there is a waterfowl cult in the Celtic religion. You can consult my forthcoming monograph again for the details on the Germanic etymologies referring to waterfowls and geese. Here I would like to draw another contact-induced scenario for this name. Cantuni could be a Germanicized Celtic name, Condunis. Condunis would be an entheos compound consisting of the Celtic prefix com, con, com, together with, and the lexeme duno, castle, fortress. The overall meaning would then be something like having the same castle or having a fortress together. External support for this etymology of the theonym can perhaps be drawn from the Celtic personal name Codunus, which is attested once in Cologne and once as Coduna in Belgica. Again, a look on the map demonstrates that both instances of the personal name Codunus are not very far from each other, and more importantly, that both the personal name Codunus and the theonym are located in Cologne, in the middle of the contact zone between Celts and Germanic tribes. After dealing with a lot of goddesses, we will now address a male god of great importance, Hercules Magusanus. He is one of the Celtic gods who were important enough to be assigned to the Roman god Hercules by Interpretatio Romana. <coughs> Some older interpretations of the name is a genuinely Germanic theonym, stand in opposition to today's cumulus opinio that Magusanus is a Germanicized Celtic theonym. You can consult my forthcoming book on the theonyms again for the details on these earlier accounts. Today I would like to limit my demonstration to the common view that Magusanus is a Celtic compound of the lexemes Mogu, Mighty, and Zeno Old. The name has formally adapted to a phonological Germanic form as Magusanus. With Magu deriving from Celtic Mogu, we have another instance of a Celtic O being transformed into Germanic A. The vowel change in the second constituent from A to A is explained by Burley and Burley and De Bernardo Stempel as follows. The originally short and stressed A of Senos is lengthened to long E within Gaulish, and then it was Germanicized to A probably referring to the Northwest Germanic low ring long A to A. The orthographic representation Makusanos from Utrecht, in fact, could show a further step in the Germanization process. The substitution of voiced K to voiceless K in the manner of the Germanic consonant shift. It is probably the very central role of Magusanos in the pagan pantheon of the Celtic and Germanic tribes which accounts for the rather wide distribution of his cult 
across Europe, including attestations from Britannia, Lugudonensis, and uh, Dacia, and even Rome. Most likely, it was the Batavian soldiers who donated an altar to the domestic god far away from their homes. The last dionym we will deal with today is the name of the Dia Viradectis. It is attested in quite an orthographic variation in Britannia, Germania Inferior, and Germania Superior. Despite the Germanic appearance of the forms in Vira, this name has a secure Celtic etymology. It is cognate to Old Irish Ferdacht, manhood, virility, and manliness. The common preform Celtic Virodectis is best analyzed as a compound of Celtic Viro, man, and Decti, a tea abstract noun belonging to Proto Celtic Decos, honor, pride, which underlies Old Irish Dech, the comparative of mark, good. The overall meaning of the theonym would then be something like goddess yielding manly pride or goddess of a man's honor. <clears throat> the geographical distribution in relation to the orthographic variety of this theonym is very interesting. The Germanicized form Vira is located in the north in Britannia and Germania Inferior. The more genuinely Celtic appearing variants in Viro are further in the south in Germania Superior. The most aberrant form, Virotis, is the southernmost instance of the theonym. Again, we can observe a tendency that the northern regions of the contact zone prefer the Germanicized form of the name, whereas in the southern region, regions, the more Celtic appearing form is in use. It is the orthographic variety of this name, especially, that advises us not to oversimplify the historical contact situation between the Celts and the Germanic tribes. In fact, we are more safe in assuming different stages of Germanicity and Celticity along the Rhine, and at the same time, a larger number of dialects and different grades of hybrid language in the daily use. Now, on the basis of the salmon theonyms, let us try to answer some more general research questions. Did the Germanic and the Celtic tribes originally worship the same or different deities? Judging by the names, they are mostly worshipped uh, different deities. However, doublet theonyms like the Alagaviae, Ologaviae, and partial Germanicizations of the original Celtic theonyms suggest that there was some overlapping in their respective pantheons, especially in the contact zone along the Rhine. Are the naming practices then comparable to each other? Mostly yes. Both Celtic and Germanic theonyms are either built from single or from compound words, which are either referring to characteristic traits of the god or goddess and uh, to the local affiliation of the cult to either place names or tribe names. Was the language and culture contact as attested indirectly by those theonyms unidirectional, bidirectional, or even multidirectional. I'd say mostly unidirectional, but also multidirectional. There are many instances of phon phonologically Germanicized Celtic theonyms, but almost nil examples for Germanic names which show influences from the Celtic language. One exception could be the pair of Alagabiae and Ologabiae, where some scholars have argued in favor of Celticized Germanic theonym. Furthermore, many Celtic or even Latin names were used with the Germanicized suffixes ech, inech, anech, ahe, and ihen. On the contact induced genesis of these suffixes <coughs> in the article from 2015. As an example for a Latin theonym with a Celto Germanic suffix, I would like to refer to the matron's name Julinechiae, which probably derives from the Celto Latin place name Juliacum, today's Julich, and to the Romanehai, which itself is a phonologically deprived derivation from the Latin adjective Romanus with the celto germanic suffix E. What role did the Romans play in the transmission process of common ritual practices and in naming and worshiping the indigenous deities? Some Celtic or Germanic gods or goddesses like Hercules Magusanus were even worshipped in Rome or in distant Roman provinces like Dacia. 
So we might infer that the cult of the respected <coughs> god in its Interpretatio Romana became prominent among Romans and other tribes. Therefore, the Romans were quite open-minded and they accepted or even adopted some cults of the indigenous tribes. Also, we can be very thankful to the Roman scribes who wrote down the indig indigenous theonyms in the Celtic and Germanic forms, although the matrix language of the inscriptions was Latin. Without the Romans, we wouldn't have one single epigraphic testimony of the Celtic and Germanic gods' names. <coughs> what led the indigenous tribes to associating some of their locally worshipped deities with the common, common Roman gods like Mercurius, Mars, Apollo, etc., and have the indigenous names appear as postponed epithets thereof. At first, we do not know if it was the indigenous tribes or the Romans who first coined this association of indigenous gods with the Roman ones. I suggest the Romans did it in order to help their soldiers and colleagues to understand the local cults. I see the Roman epithets of indigenous gods in the way of, say, vernacular glosses to a Latin text, only the other way around, that is in order to help comprehending the local religion and the manifold foreign names in the Latin inscriptions. Later in history, during the Christianization of Europe, many of the pagan rituals and festivities were adopted by the Christian church and implanted into the Christian calendars. But the difference is they renamed them. Thus, the Interpretatio Romana is probably a comparable but less radical way of coping with different religious systems and with the similarities and differences between them. So one could ask, uh, why then did not all theonyms of Germanic and Celtic origin undergo this allocation as per Interpretatio Romana? I do not really have an answer to this. I can only <coughs> assume that perhaps not for every indigenous god there was a Roman equivalent in terms of functions or attributes of this god. And also, some indigenous gods were probably not big or important enough to be allocated a Roman epithet. <clears throat> Does the geographic distribution of linguistically Celtic or Germanic theonyms match our knowledge about the historical settlements of Celtic or Germanic tribes in this area? Yes. Let us compare the map, which I copied from Schumacher's 2007 article. Um, his and my overall picture is Germanic tribes are situated in the north and northeast of the natural border uh, along the Rhine, and Celtic tribes in the south and southwest of it. Thank you for your attention. And now I'm curious about your questions and comments. Thank you very much. Uh, question? Could you look at this as smooth or not? My names prob probably are just epithets referring to the same god, so he couldn't be the son of two different goddesses. Yes. <laughs> so we suppose that this perhaps Sliodin is just an epithet. If it means, as we also thought, uh, has to do with uh, Sliodin, then it opens up an interesting perspective on possible Indo-European Indo Indo um, aspects involved. Mm -hmm. You think that 
uh, about the name Herakle. Mm -hmm. And also in Vedic, we found an instance, perhaps we, we went too far, but where it says that Indra is the son of Shrava. So there's an expression used in, in the Veda which, which we found interesting to compare. So it would be interesting, interested in hearing what, what you think of these speculations. Um. Yeah, I have, I have treated in my dissertation those uh, traditional accounts of Kulana, which are fully Germanic, of course, and no contact scenario. Um, I do not say that these are not true, but uh, the, the, I think this is a quite uh, convincing parallel to this Tutveda and something like Kulana, if it derives from Klebos, from the fame word of the European, is itself, of course, only a, an epithet of a goddess. Yeah. whose name made, uh, with, would be something else, maybe, earlier in time. And many of these names are speaking names that is referring to some attributes of the god or goddess in question. And I think Kludana and Klutveda is quite a speaking name, the famous one. And there is a sp story behind it. And we probably don't know the story, or we might find a parallel in some Vedic tra uh, traditions, just like uh, Ricardo did in the previous talk. These connections it's very interesting but i'm i'm really focusing on the on the etym etymologies and i'm just um giving an overview of but you don't think it could so you think it's a celtic name and it couldn't be a germanic name it can be a germanic name <laughs> but um and, and some like the alagavia and ologavia where we have both attested we cannot just decide what it is or if it was there in both languages from the start um so it, it can be the Germanic continuation of the Klebos word parallel to the Celtic continuation of the Klebos word. But the difference in suffixes suggested that it's some uh, downward uh, continuation of the Klebos word just with different suffixes. Because then we would have Klutona tested in Gornish if it's a direct loan. So yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate your comment. Uh, thank you so much yes, for very interesting material. Um, well, my uh, well, observation or impression, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering if you are not taking too far away the things. So from what we, we know about the uh, well, Germania and uh, Italia at, at, that, at that time, well, the situation of uh, ethnic uh, contact, ethnic intermission probably didn't, was there. But uh, in general, so like uh, looking from the social linguistic perspective, uh, so the situation of contact does not necessarily lead to uh, to borrowings, and so that's what what you are doing apparently. So trying to to show that yes, so there was uh, there were borrowings uh, both directions, you know? and um, in this sense, yes, yeah, so the uh, I think the, the criteria uh, on which you define uh, so the original form or ethnic, so to say. Uh, a pertinence of the name is, is very important. And so I probably missed the point, yes, but I not quite understand so why uh, um, the distinction between Viro and Vira should necessarily uh, be interpreted as a German or a Celtic form. So this is the question, and so in, in, in my short comment, the, uh, the example which I uh, found um, quite convincing is uh, Andy Marka. So I do not see any, any strong evidence really to take Marka as, as German, you know, so, and uh, as far as, uh, so, well, uh, Delama uh, uh, cites uh, personal name, uh, Andio Marcus, and actually something like uh, Amphipos, um, having uh, forces on both sides, but to my mind, so the name uh, is quite uh, quite normal for, for a person or for a deity, you know, so like having a uh, border on both sides, it doesn't sound like very not having a border on both sides, but living on both sides of the border. Mm -hmm. And that would be ah. referring to the common culture zone of Germanic ah, tribes and Celtic tribes worshipping so the same they, deities. They the and then the, most of the names coming from the Celtic side, but uh, Germanized phonologically. And that's what I try to map here on this uh, in geographical distributions. I'm not saying that Virodek, this is a Germanic continuation, and Virodak, this is a Celtic one, but it's stemming from the Celtic Lexemes and then was phonologically Germanicized. And the phonological representations are mapped and they uh, are just perfect with what we know about this historical settlement. So it, it just fits 
Okay, but this the, the idea that, uh, so for example, uh, all reflects like an uh, original German name, is, is it yours, your idea, or is uh, are you oh. already building on, on some of the things? You like just said that O is Germanic, no, because R is Germanic equivalent of Kelsigo. Mm -hmm. That's what I said, and that's just, um, of course, there are Germanic names with O, like Langobardi, Langobardi. Um, but I mean, finally, so we do not know uh, so much about uh, Turkic dialects, so to be sure that's that, just, yes, yeah. so that's uh, simply so, um, a distinction, the dialectal distinction within Celtic. That might be, yes, we do not know anything about dialects. Uh, that's what I said uh, uh, concerning the Viradectis and the, a lot of orthographic variations that we have, a lot of stages and unknown dialects that we, there's somehow uh, <laughs> differentiation that we do not know and we do not oversimplify things and saying this is Celtic, this is Germanic. I just try to show tendencies and show them on the map. There's one last question here, yeah. yeah um, Thank you for the, the, the mapping, I found it really fascinating. And I had the impression, and I'm wondering if you have the impression that you mapped all of them, because you're showing us a little bit of time. I had the impression that they were very um, much on the same north-south plane. Yes. And almost like the first ones, especially the first couple, where there's kind of so many, um, that they almost moved in the order you gave them, and they almost moved from east to west. Yes. Um, did you see that tendency as well? And I didn't uh, map all 364 names that I worked on, only the ones for the talk right now, because mm -hmm. uh, we have the doublet forms in which are worth mapping. I didn't map just Germanic or just Celtic mm -hmm. ones, but it's the overall picture that we get along the Rhine is the culture contact zone, left to it the Celts, right to it the Germanic tribes and the Romans who settled there made it possible that we can grasp this con contact at all because they wrote it down. Um, yes, you, you said that it moves down a bit. That's because at the end of it, the, the, the names are more probably Celtic. At the, at the beginning, Alagabia, I argued, are more Germanic than Celtic, or we don't know, but some argued that it's uh, like a German, Germanic form, the original one, which was borrowed into Celtic. So that would explain it that the more south we go, the more uh, probable is that it's a, it's a Celtic name. And I'm sorry, maybe my question was misunderstood, but, but my point was that on the, for each of the individual names, yes. um, that you have the more, sorry, more Germanic forms, more Celtic forms, you know, in the north south. My point was they look very, in their placement, they look very sort of directly north south. They're, they're not like, you know, they're like this and not this. Yes. You know what I mean? And then like the first one was right here, the next one was right here. And yeah. it's almost that, that the east-west distribution of these names was not very broad. That's true, yeah. But most of the testimonies we have are along the Rhine and the Rhine in the northern region is oh, just yeah. going down. So yeah, right. that's okay. maybe the reason for it. So one very quick last question. Uh, Not just one. Yeah, no, <laughs> Choose one. <laughs> about it, uh, alternating in, in uh, Uzana between the E and uh, Serta. Also, this uh, reflects. Mm, it reflects uh, a Roman scribe trying to write down a Germanic fricative. Uh, yeah, we can't. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but. I, I'd say because of the uh, T of Gaulish, that it's the thorn. Um, but maybe the Roman scribe himself didn't know the difference between voice and voiceless fricative because he had, had, didn't have it in his own language. So let's end this session with this mystery and let's <laughs> thank our speaker again. <laughs>